Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts here on the show today, Jamie, joined by Anna. And we have somebody who I'm really uh, super excited to talk to here today. I follow you on Twitter and uh, I know we got introduced to you via another mutual friend, uh, Kendra. And so, Anthony, uh, really excited to have you on and learn more about your company and, uh, you know, uh, talk some about wine. And uh, you may maybe we'll go back into ping pong since that was, you know, the conversation before. Before we started, but Anthony, uh, glad to have you on here today. Yeah, absolutely, Jamie and Anna. Really excited and thrilled to be able to have this conversation. Well, uh, for people who don't know you, uh, could you give us just like the 30 seconds of uh, what you do today? And we'll get into your story more, but just kind of that quick intro to you. Yeah, so everybody, I'm Anthony Jang. I co founded a company called VinoVest that provides access for anybody to be able to invest in wine as an alternative asset class. Awesome. And uh, what is uh, another thing that we always start off with is just a question about food. Um, So, you know, what kind of speaks to you about food? It could be your favorite thing, um, you know, being that you uh, work in the wine, maybe it's wine, but, uh, you know, or type of cuisine or even favorite place. Like sometimes people talk about cities, but it's kind of like whatever speaks to you about food. We always kind of like to start with that. Yeah, I mean, Anna and I, before the show, we were talking about Bole, actually. Uh, you know, recording on Cinco de Mayo, not sure when this is going to come out, but I was just telling her how excited I was to try this new recipe for Bole uh, that we're about to make later tonight with some friends. And we were just saying how uh, the reason I got really into it was I watched this documentary about this family in Mexico that uh, had this recipe that, uh, you know, they make a mole and then every single time they would save a little bit to use as the base for the next time they would make the mole and that recipe because it was just word of mouth was passed down through generations and generations and became this really layered and rich sort of flavor where um, they never really knew what exactly was in it because sometimes you have more ingredients of one thing sometimes you might be missing another thing and just how i think that food would tell the story and be able to pass down through multiple uh, generations, I thought was really cool and attempting to recreate some of the same myself later tonight. So Anthony, is your wife going to cook it or are you going to cook it? I'm going to be, I'm going to be a really, really great supporter. Um, I'll help to taste as well. But, uh, <laughs> That's a critical job. It's, it's really to, to say that she will be doing pretty much all the work. Uh, <laughs> so what wine pairs well with mole and what are you making it red, green, brown? Like what kind of, I'm, I'm interested to hear what wine pairs with it well. Yeah. So this one I think is going to be more of like a brown mole. Mm-hmm. Um, and then wine pairings i think i think because it's in good Mayo, we're gonna just go with the margarita uh, yeah that's um, a so classic. that is just like it's <laughs> it is blazingly hot in la as well so that that just sounds pretty nice right now but yes. i think if we were to pair with wine um it would be something a little bit more like lighter and on the more refreshing side to kind of complement always kind of like a heavier sweeter spicy dish right so it'd probably be like a white wine like a gruner vetliner which is uh usually like a lower alcohol type of uh type of wine that is more of like a palate cleanser than something like super bold like a big red from napa valley interesting i'm taking notes for later <laughs> are you making so, some Anthony... tonight too <laughs> no i'm i'm going out for mola instead uh, of making it <laughs> well it's cinco it, it's cinco de mayo though too right like that's what i saw online if people have been tagging me in mayo posts so can, can you make mole with with uh, mayo too you can certainly try. There's there's no there's no hard and fast rule there. So please feel to be creative and send me a pic if you decide to attempt that. Just merging all kinds of cultures there. And another fun uh, question we like to ask is what was your first money memory? First money memory. I think it was in college, right? This was the first time where I had my own bank account. And I remember, um, you know, with our, the scholarship that I got, I got a certain budget to be able to spend on books and I just didn't spend money on books and I just put it into, um, I believe it was a Wealthfront account, which is like a robo advisor. So I was like, all right, I'm so smart. I'm like, like not scamming the system, but I'm like getting ahead, right? I'm like not paying money for books because they're thousands of dollars and I don't believe in that. I'm going to just put into money in my future. And I remember like 
that being something that really excited me. That's really cool. That uh so did you just uh did you just how did you get by without the books, I guess, too? What <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just having some great generous friends to study with. <laughs> that was that was the best part, right? I definitely am not one of those like solo study type of people. I'm definitely love to be able to be at least in a pair when we're cramming for a test or an assignment and you know a lot of these uh you know a lot of these folks they they're very willing to do it right they're done yeah. studying they'll pass it on to me was there any class where you, you you changed your mind and went back and got a book there were a few a few of them you know the professors were, were pretty strict they're like everyone needs their own book yeah which i never understood but i was like all right fine and sometimes i'd even just like just photocopy the pages I needed and just like, <laughs> just like staple them together. Like, hey, here's my book. And it kind of get mad, but I'm like, it's the same words, just a different exactly. piece of paper. Like, what does it, what does it really matter? You know, what I've been renting my books at school. I, I'm in a, a master's program, and Dr. Craig Lemoyne was teasing me. He's like, "Do we not pay you enough?" I'm like, "No, I'm fine. I just don't. I don't want to buy them. It's like I don't know what my problem is, but I've been renting them, and that's worked out really well for me. And I'm one of those yeah. generous students that'll share my notes and stuff like that. Yeah, I still have some textbooks right back here over my shoulder. <laughs> I I like having them. I like. I actually hate courses with like, p the they have those like. They're kind of like PDFs, but they're like built in, so you can't even print them, right? That tech like yeah, locks it down now. And I'm like, at least give me like a PDF I can save, but those like locked down ones, like I would rather just pay for it. Like I really hate those because like I can't print it, I can't save it. I'm not a fan of logging into a portal for like an additional book that I, yeah, it, it, I would yeah, much rather make pay. it a little bit harder than it needs to be. And like sometimes you just want to print it out and highlight stuff and circle stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like exactly. So, Anthony, I'm curious, what did you want to be when you were growing up as a little kid? And how did you get to, to where you are now? I wanted to be a CEO. <laughs> it's always been the goal. Uh, but I thought that goal entailed me being like, all right, study hard in high school, get into a great college, then like study hard in college to get a good job and then have a good track record at my job to be able to go back and get an MBA learn how to start a business and then maybe start a business after that. But uh, I ended up dropping out of school to find my first company in college and kind of took a, took a different path. So what was the, yeah, walk us through it. So what was that company and uh, kind of where did that inspiration for the company come from? I was a freshman at USC and I think like a lot of college students, right, just studying late in the libraries. And I remember one of our friends saying like, oh my God, I'm so hungry. I'd literally pay somebody 10 bucks to you know, deliver me a Chipotle burrito right now. And I was like, really? I'll, I'll do that for $10. That's a free burrito right there. <laughs> Just took that as like a study break, cruised over to the Chipotle, did that. And I was like, okay, here you go. And then um, I think it was just like one week where I didn't have too much going on. I posted a few flyers in my door and I was like, hey, like, dorm room delivery to your door right and i was like text this number venmo this number what you want here's our delivery fee and then i just like sat in my dorm getting a bunch of text messages running around to different restaurants on campus and i called that side business envoy now and more and more students were like hey i want to make money doing the same thing that you're doing that's pretty easy to do around my class schedule and then we obviously had the demand because students are always hungry all the time and that's how it grew and grew. And uh, we ended up having the opportunity to uh, um, get uh, an award called the Teal Fellowship, which gives uh, students $100,000 to drop out of school and pursue their business. So I took that. That gave me the freedom to be able to support myself while running my business um, and was able to grow it to, we had, uh, before we got acquired, we had 23 markets in college campuses nationwide and hundreds of thousands of students. Uh, who'd use the app who ended up acquiring it it was a walmart subsidiary okay and are they still using it in a similar way or did they it's more for local delivery now so not just food but for for anything right and there's there's always a big walmart next to every college town because <laughs> you know they need all that stuff right so it was uh i can definitely see how they're using you know our our platform, what we built to help them power that last mile. 
what was that process? Uh, I mean, uh, were you there through the whole the kind of acquisition and driving that, or did you kind of outsource that to somebody or hire a banker or just kind of handled it yourself? So we got acquired by Joyrun, um, the company that ended up becoming the Walmart subsidiary. So we went through an acquisition, then that company went through another acquisition just a year later. So I wasn't involved in the second one, but with the first acquisition, since I was a CEO, I uh, was able to you know, be pretty intimately involved in all of the, the details there and the transition into the larger company. What was probably, I mean, what was the biggest lesson you probably learned going through a sale and acquisition? Oh, I mean. <laughs> How easy it is, we, right? Uh, <laughs> it's so easy. It's just like, you know, someone puts a number on a piece of paper, slides it across the table. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, it, it was just so much to think about, right? It's not just about the money, right? It's about all the other people that work at your company. Where are they going to be placed, right? What are their futures going to be like? Because they signed on to my company for a reason, right? They see that future, but how can we take care of them? How can we take care of our shareholders? Who well, I have that fiduciary responsibility for? And then just make sure it's the right home for the company. So all of those things are more than just numbers, right? It's about, about people, it's about roles, it's about just seeing the fit between the two companies to make sure that it, it works out because um, you know a lot of acquisitions just end up being like, all right, we bought you, and then we just shut you down two years later, right? So we did definitely uh, wanted to be more than just that. Um, and, uh, that was, you know, that was a lot of back and forth, a lot of sleepless nights and considering and calling up our investors and advisors who had experience with acquisitions to, to really help and use them as a sounding board. So talk to us a little bit about VinoVest. Like how did that idea come about? How did you, you know, launch that company and venture? Yeah. So this was after the acquisition. It was, starting to be more active with investing my own money. And I just didn't want to do the whole like stocks and bonds, 60, 40 traditional portfolio. So I was really interested in exploring alternatives, started investing in crypto, started investing in other private companies like angel investing. Um, and then I read an, an article, I believe it was on the Wall Street Journal that was talking about a list of all these luxury assets that ultra wealthy people were investing in that had all outperformed the market. And on that list, you've got like art, right? You've got classic cars, you've got um, luxury handbags even, and then wine and whiskey. And all of them seemed, you know, really cool. But to me, wine and whiskey was just really stood out to me because it's the thing that I had the most just sort of exposure to, right? A, a 20 something year old probably doesn't get a lot of classic car and art and luxury handbag exposure. But I've certainly drank a lot of wine and whiskey <laughs> up to that point. So I was like, all right, let's do that. And even if I'm not like the smartest wine investor, um, you know, if I don't beat the market, I've still got a bunch of nice wine, right? That's not the worst sort of downside scenario as an investor where in the stock market, you know, you can't do much if your stock loses like 30% of its value. So I got into that space, uh, tried to do it myself and just realized how hard it was. Like you really do need to be very wealthy or like just obsessed with wine to get in this space because you need to have like insider knowledge, you need to figure out storage. And I definitely did not have that. And then realizing that I knew what to buy, but didn't have access to how to buy it. The only options I had next was to either work through a private broker or an auction house. And I remember just going through an auction process and it was really stressful, first of all, and then just realizing that, all right, I sold this bottle of wine then realizing the um, you know, the auction house has like a 20, 30% fee on top of that. I'm like, whoa, this is, this is just not feasible for me to do. And I was down like tens of thousands of dollars just on setting up the infrastructure and the research before I even bought a single bottle of wine. And I was like, all right, um, this is pretty much impossible to do as like a normal lay person. That's probably why it's only reserved for the ultra wealthy. And that doesn't really seem right. I think there should be just more open access to quality alternative assets to, to regular people, just like the stock market. Um, and I want to change that. So that's really where the sort of vision and mission for VNLVS came about. And so what is the, so tell me a little bit then how the structure of the company evolved and how it does simplify it for more people to get involved. 
Yeah, so at, at the core of it, we want to make it really easy for anybody, regardless of how much wine knowledge they have, to be able to invest in wine. And the way that we do that is through really taking care of all of the sort of uh, expertise that you need to know in the market, right? We help you based on your goals, actually construct that portfolio of wines. We help you buy those wines. We help you store those wines and insure those wines. We help you track the prices on those wines for updated appraisals. And we ultimately help you sell them when, when the time for you to realize your, your gains are, are there, right? So we're kind of that all in one shop where uh, we want to make it easy for you to just get started, right? Dip your toe in, put some skin in the game. And once people have skin in the game, it puts them in a position where they're much more motivated to learn. Um, and we also offer a lot of educational material along the way in the form of consultations, webinars, content, and everything like that, so that they can realize like, all right, you know, Vino Vest bought me these 10 cases of wine. Why did they buy those? What makes these special, right? Why are some wines going up more than others, right? And things like that, where they start to understand the dynamics as they're kind of going deeper and deeper into the space. So what is a, what's kind of like a common goal as you brought that up for a wine <laughs> investor that's coming to VinoVest? I think, especially in these past few months, right? The stock market has been incredibly volatile uh, and people are realizing that it's probably not going to get much better, especially for the near term. So the big goal is diversification, right? They want to, invest in something that doesn't go up when stocks go up, doesn't go down when stocks go down. And traditionally, the wine uh, market has had about a 0.13 correlation rate. So it's it's pretty much no correlation to the stock market. Um, and they like that, right? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is just investing in something that's reliable and tangible and has utility to help them beat inflation, right? Everyone's talking about inflation and how they can help to hedge it. And they know that just sitting on cash is not the right move. And they want to invest in something that is perhaps a little bit less volatile than the market. And the wine market is inherently just a lot more stable. It doesn't have huge intraday swings since people are not day trading bottles of wine yet, at least. Um, so I'd say those are probably the two big reasons, like diversification and the hedge against inflation. So Anthony, earlier you talked about like having you know everyday people kind of want being able to invest in this type of asset class are you finding that across the, the board that it is everyday people investing in in th these products or is it kind of still the one percent or whatever or is, is it really extending out to to folks yeah so our I, I really think we're reaching that sort of more mainstream audience because um we've got over uh, ten thousand folks who have joined us and the median investment size is under two thousand dollars so it's people who are um, brand new to the world of wine investing. Most of them don't even know that this was even a thing that you could invest in. Um, and they're just testing it out, right? They're not they're not wealthy or else they probably have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into things. Um, they're a lot younger than I think your typical wine collector, wine investor would look like. And um, you know, they're still sort of on on the on the financial sort of um like wealth building journey, right? They're Maybe they've got their stock portfolio. Maybe they're invested in a couple other things, but they're still actively sort of built that up, right? This is this is sort of part of their diversification, part of their journey. I'm also curious about like the whole notion of education on what the wine itself. Like, are, are have you taken classes, or do you like through VinoVest do your investors have access to that type of stuff? Because that's so interesting to me, like learning about that aspect of the actual wine itself and what it what makes it value what makes it valuable and what makes it invaluable. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's one of the biggest things that we're looking to really build and create because there's no place like that apart from Vino Vest, right? And we want to be able to relate every single bottle, just like you would learn about a stock, right? Like you look at an Apple stock, you're able to see its track record. You're able to see what are the products it produces. If you're able to see what are the, you know, sort of returns that you're able to expect on that stock and what it's looking to release in the future. And same thing with the winery where you're like, all right, how long has this winery been around? How many bottles has it been producing each year in the past? How those bottles appreciated, you know, after five years, after their release, after 10 years, after 20 years, and then who's managing the company, right? Um, and 
how many changes of ownership has it had, right? And how is, say, if it's a Napa Valley wine, how is just the region of Napa been doing in terms of its global popularity, right? Those are kind of more macro trends. And we have all that sort of information all laid out um, on pretty much every single wine. And there's, there's tens of thousands of wines out there that we're creating content for that really helps to, in our hope, create parallels between the stock market, which a lot of people you know, are, are taking as their basis for knowledge before coming to Vino Best and sort of bringing those parallels to, to the wine market. What's the biggest risk, I guess, for a like wine investor? Like, what's the thing that I, I mean, because you think about like, I mean, you can go through like bonds and markets and kind of lay out risks. So what, what are kind of the biggest investment risks when it relates to wine? I think uh, a couple large ones I see are number one storage risk, right? Unlike a stock where you know it's it's fully digital, it's there's no sort of damaging or breaking it. A wine is a physical product, right? If you store it too cold or too hot or improperly, it's going to break and go to zero. Uh, number two is uh, authentication risk. There's a lot of fraud out there. Just I think with any luxury good where there's more demand than supply. Is always counterfeiters, right? So, buying authentic wine, storing it in the right location, is uh, two of honestly the hardest parts to get if you're doing this on your own. So you, you brought up a good point on like, like storage in the, you know, bond and even now moving in the crypto space and stock space is all really moved to like qualified custodians, right? Like big name custodians that mm-hmm. handle all of the money. Um, for storage of wine, has there been kind of a similar development into which like there are, I, I mean, I'm sure they exist, right? But professional wine storage companies that store these investments versus people that store it at home. And what's kind of the balance between that? Yeah, so we only store in professional facilities, and we actually only buy wine either direct from winery or from professional facilities. So we won't take the risk of buying from anybody's private collection because you know it's more of a he said she said thing, right? We don't know how they stored it, even though they could be you know, they could say they stored it perfectly. Um, and there are large professional warehouses all around the world that are storing. You know, a lot of them are storing billions of dollars worth of wine. On behalf of not just us, but a lot of other, you know, wine buyers and distributors and auction houses that need that sort of same level of standard. So it's more like a global standard, right? It's like mm-hmm. this is the highest quality wine you can get. This is we've taken all these precautions to make sure that the wine uh, is de-risked, so that it can have uh, that sort of trust when it enters the secondary market. And I've always had the, you know, I, I guess people joke about this part too, but at like end game for collectible and investable wine is what? Like when you think about the actual bottles, is it to eventually be consumed? Is it more like art where eventually you have bottles that obviously have passed a time period in which they would be drank anymore, right? That you would just keep. But what what is the typical end game when you're thinking of collectible wines? Most of it is going to be consumed, right? That's either going to private collectors, high-end wine retailers, high-end restaurants. So those are sort of like the end consumers where you know, they'll buy it from uh, a company like ours. They'll mark it up at retail or mark it up on a restaurant menu and then serve it to the end customer. And what's the typical hold period for an investor? It, I don't know if there's like an average because obviously they're going to range dramatically like mm-hmm. anyone holding equities or any other type of investment but is there do you see an average hold period yeah for us our uh customers are looking fairly long term they're looking like seven to eight years on average um, people can go as short as five as long as like you know some people are like hey like 20 years i'm not i'm just looking to put this money away i want to be pleasantly surprised in 20 years right so um, i think this is definitely something where you can take a more long-term approach because you know, it just takes time for wine to age. Nobody can speed or slow that down. Um, and then the other thing that drives the increase in wine prices is just more people consuming wine. And that also takes time for, you know, maybe <laughs> after one year, right, uh, a winery that produced those 10,000 bottles released into the market, 
after year two, there's maybe only 5,000 left. And year three, there's like 3,000 left, right? So that also takes time unless we're all just having a huge wine drinking party one day. Well, after the pandemic, you never know. <laughs> yeah, Numbers I mean, went up. It's <laughs> certainly gone up since the pandemic. Absolutely. So Anthony, tell us a little bit about like the growth of VinoVest, how, you know, you've you've been growing in terms of both the people you serve and your you know employees or anything like that. I'm so curious about that. Yeah. Uh, so our, our company is about a little bit over two years old. Uh, we were launched right before the pandemic started. And I remember, uh, I think it was back in February of 2020 when there were those huge swings in the stock market. You know, I think it was down like 20, 30 percent. We're like, oh, my God, is this the worst time to launch a wine investing <laughs> company? Uh, but to our surprise, or I guess not not really surprised now, but um, the wine market didn't really budge. Uh, it was fully sort of on its, on its own path. And people started to realize that they're like, all right, this you know, this maybe isn't so far-fetched or crazy after all. Uh, maybe I should put some of my uh, total assets into wine. Um, and I think that sort of increased curiosity of more active retail investors has helped us out a lot in terms of just tailwinds, people being open to listening to investing in something new. And we've seen some pretty incredible growth. Right? We've gone from, from zero to 10,000 customers in, in a couple of years. And, um, a lot of them are, you know, as I said, just brand new, right? Some of them don't even drink, and they're just looking at this purely from a financial basis. And then many who, you know, are more like me, they're like, hey, like, I like wine, I don't know much about it, but I think it would be cool to do. So I guess when you um, look at wines and you start thinking about, like, adding it into a portfolio, is and and I'm sure that there is a decent amount of research out there on this, uh, but it's probably mostly geared towards higher end investors. If that's historically been where it's set, is there like a rule of thumb on like that you've seen or that you talk about for like an allocation percentage? Uh, obviously, some people are doing it because you said right they don't want to be in the market; they're more interested in wine. So that's more of like you know the passion is then driving some of it, but from like an asset allocation standpoint, is there, are there any rules of thumbs around where wine fits in and where it improves the total portfolio? Yeah, I think um, for us, when we're looking at asset allocation, for any alternatives, we usually recommend like, hey, like just put 5% in to start out with. Um, and that could be a part of like an alternatives portfolio that may be 20%, right? So maybe you're investing in three other things but um, depending on how those other assets are doing, you may want to kind of focus and streamline your portfolio a little bit, uh, you know, go up or down on that asset allocation, depending on how your other investments are doing and how much volatility those investments are bringing, right? Because if you have something extremely volatile, like high growth tech stocks or even cryptocurrency, you might want more of something that's a little bit more steady and, and safe like wine. Um, but if you're just investing in large cap stocks that don't have too much volatility or you got a lot of bonds, then maybe the need for stability is a little bit less. Then taking it kind of one step further inside of the wine world, I saw a, tw a, a tweet or whatever from you that was talking about like which wine uh, I think you know champagne versus something else performed the best in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, is there is there inside like if you're constructing a portfolio from wine is there a diversification um kind of mindset that still applies inside the wine and is it you know from wineries ages types of wine because it looks like right vastly different performances and i guess you don't really know what becomes um fully back in like favor right in five years from today right like certain types of wine you know like chardonnays for whatever reason might be more popular in five years than today right mm -hmm. jamie i'm really glad you brought that up because there certainly is diversification within the asset class right i think if you're thinking about a stock portfolio you might be thinking of like blue chips versus you know growth stocks versus like small cap versus emerging market right and there's really certainly a lot of parallels between that too, where we look at blue chips, which would be coming from really well-established regions, like maybe Bordeaux in France or Napa, California. And then there's also emerging markets, right? Like you said, 
there may be some uh, places where people didn't really want wine from that are suddenly becoming a lot more popular or maybe a winery gets acquired has a change in ownership and starts really turning things around right so there are certainly those more exciting opportunities that can present a little bit more speculation but also a lot more growth potential and there's also your sort of like tried and true ones where you know, they've been making the same wine for 300 years right mm -hmm. you know the track record and there's not much deviation from that so Anthony, I want to shift gears a little bit, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so I know that your, you know, your story and your background is one of great resilience, and I'm curious, like, what's behind your resilience, and what drives and motivates you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in terms of the story of resilience and, and drive, right? About about six years ago, I had a pretty serious accident, um, suffered a spinal cord injury that left me a quadriplegic, and um, you know, there was there was a point where you know I was on a ventilator for four months. I wasn't even sure if I could even be able to breathe on my own without an assisted device for the rest of my life. So things got um, you know, things got pretty simple for me in the terms that like the goals that I wanted were not just like making as much money as I could or like traveling the world, right? It's just like, how can I even breathe on my own tonight? How can I even figure out how to eat independently without somebody feeding me? And uh, you really just need to will yourself to make it work because nobody else is going to help you recover, right? You need to make it work. And I think that um, that sort of same mentality is true for building companies, right? It's not just a straight line up. Most more frequently, it's definitely like just fighting and fighting and fighting and figuring it out. And, you know, especially when you're the founder and you're, you know, a part of a very small team, right? You have to be self-motivated. You have to be able to run into a brick wall and still keep going because you don't have any other option, right? You don't have a backup plan. And that's, you know, that's really, that's how it was like, right? Like my backup plan was to be on a ventilator and I didn't want that because I just, I couldn't do that, right? That was something I just didn't want to accept. So that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, how I've just started to approach a lot of other things in life. What were some of the big, I mean, you mentioned two of them. What were some of the big milestones, I guess, on the recovery, right? So breathing, right? Unassisted is probably a huge one, you know, food. But what were some other things you had to kind of learn new that just felt like big milestones when you got there? Yeah, another big goal of mine was to be able to use a wheelchair independently. Uh, in the early days, I was using... A power chair which is you know, just like a remote controlled chair right and that's pretty easy as long as you have um you know you don't even need any sort of function below your uh below your shoulders to use that because a lot of times they've got ones that hook up to your mouth and you can kind of use as a joystick there uh, but i wanted to use a, a manual wheelchair one that i could push on my own uh, using my arms because i thought just having a more active lifestyle would would lead to just better outcomes for me and better like cardiovascular exercise but um, it was it was really really tough to be able to make that transition and in the beginning I lost a lot of independence because of that right I couldn't couldn't push outside because there was a slight incline or I needed help somebody pushing me down down a ramp because I would lose control and run into a tree <laughs> so things like that I was just like I want this I want this I want this and finally you know now I'm able to push pretty independently in a, in a manual wheelchair. That was a huge achievement for me. And uh, another one I'm currently working on is going back to driving independently. So that's a huge thing where, you know, before you drive, you know, you got your two legs working and now everything is hand controls and it's crazy to just relearn where it's like, all right, your feet aren't doing anything now. It's just your arms doing more crazy things. And it feels like I'm in like a space cockpit with all these like dials and <laughs> controls and things and like that. Well, um, so that's that's currently something I'm working on right now with my, you know, with my occupational therapist. And I guess another follow up question to that is, you know, I guess I and mean, you, you don't have to answer these if you don't feel like it. But um, it, how do you feel like people have changed in the way they react to you now? Right. Like it, it, probably how people interact with you has changed. Yeah, it really has been different. And I honestly didn't realize it too much because you know we spent the last three years in a pandemic everything's been on zoom and i would say that 99 percent of the people who i meet 
don't really know him in a wheelchair, right? Because just head and shoulders all the time. And then, you know, recently it's just been more in-person meetups and they're like, whoa, you know, I didn't know you're in a wheelchair. I'm like, yeah, I guess it's not really something that comes up in like a meet and greet intro call for 30 minutes, right? Yeah. That's something that I think uh, startles a lot of people. Um, But everyone, you know, or or most people are just more from a, a perspective of curiosity, right? Like before my injury, I didn't know many people in mm-hmm. wheelchairs and I just wanted to know how I could be best like a- accommodating or helpful and things like that. And most people are like that, right? So it's okay to ask questions just to know because everyone's condition is different. So I think just seeing a lot more of that and um, I think just a lot more planning to going to places where you got to call the restaurant to make sure they don't have stairs to get in and uh, when you call an airline and call a hotel, right? There's just extra things and steps uh, of a checklist before you go out. And have you found like a community of people who kind of have gone through, you know, similar situations to you? Or have you kind of done it with the doctors and therapists and family and friends? Or did you kind of search for anybody else to kind of, I don't know, like be a mentor in recovery? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I I was fortunate enough to receive like my sort of hospitalization and rehabilitation in a really great uh, hospital that was centered around spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury. Like that's the only two things they did. So, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, there are a lot of other hurt people at the same time as me. And you can kind of find bonding in, in that sort of shared misery, right? Where we're all there, all going through different struggles, but can understand each other and still very close with a lot of those folks today, even though we're all living our own lives in different parts of the country now. It's a very powerful community. And and thank you for sharing your story with us, Anthony. We know um, you have things to do. And and one of the questions we we love to ask at the end of the interview to have some hopeful, you know, wisdom imparted on us is what's the legacy you want to leave in this profession and in the world? Oh, wow. I think in the world, right? I want to really bring more awareness to spinal cord injury and just paralysis in general. Um, because I, I read this really startling fact right when I got hurt. It was saying that uh, most people who suffer a spinal cord injury or have some sort of paralysis, they just never return back to work, right? It was almost like more than two thirds of people are just at home, unable to work, you know, probably struggling with a lot of. You know, mental health issues right right now it's mental health awareness month as well so i just want to be an example that it's possible to go back to doing things that you love um i don't i don't know if too many other ceos of companies who are in my condition um, and i just want to be able to show that like it can still be done that's uh, that's a lot of what drives me i love that so you got to achieve that childhood dream of being the ceo and everything <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it's it, you're, you're CEO times three now, right? You've done it. This is the third one, right? Yeah. Yeah, so CEO cubed is pretty awesome. <laughs> I've never heard that before, but I'm definitely going to steal that. Yeah. That's going to be on your business cards now. <laughs> yeah, they're like, what's that exponent on the top of your title? Yeah, that'd be pretty cool, yeah. right? <laughs> Well, it, it actually cool. would be a great like lead in to telling your story, right? If you listed that, like, and people would be like, what yeah. is that? Then you could say, well, this is actually my third one. And, you know, all of them have been important yeah. to me. And, you know, it would probably be pretty cool. That's, that's really great. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this was fantastic. So best places uh, to uh, to follow you. I know you're, you're on Twitter um, and best places to follow the company, too. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think just emailing me directly. I am pretty accessible. I, I read every single email. I'm Anthony at beanovest.co. And then our, our website is beanovest.co. So if you're curious, give us a shout. We've always got folks who are ready and willing to hop on the call with you and just talk through something that I think is new to most people. Um, and we want to take that approach with everybody. That's awesome. And congrats on reading all the emails, as everybody knows. <laughs> I do not read all my emails. That, well, I don't read them on time. It's just very late by the time I get to them. So I am a, I am currently 473 oh emails unopened right now. <laughs> so there are at least like 400 people waiting on responses. Anna is included in there. 
It's okay. I understand. Yeah, at least you're open about it. That's the first step, right? It's just realizing, hey, you got a, a lot to work through. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, this was uh, amazing. Uh, you know, really, really great. I'm, I'm glad you guys waited for me too. I, I was messaging everybody. I was like, I really want to be on this one. So if you guys can just hold on. And the, this week's been crazy from travel, my Uber and traffic and my hotel thing. It, so I don't know if we have time for one more story. I'm going to tell a hotel story because this is ridiculous. So uh, we'll get you out right, on time. So I get to New York and, you know, we're supposed to go to an award ceremony. I'm supposed to go meet with Market Watch. And I've got like, 30 minutes to get ready. I go up to my room. I unpack everything. I get my tux out. I get all the little button things you got to put on a tux and the shirt and everything. Like there's a lot of extra work. And then all of a sudden my door opens and some guy just walks into the bathroom. (laughs) And I'm like, what What the hell? (laughs) 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 And I like go in there and he's like startled and I'm kind of startled. And like he clearly is like working on the bathroom. He's got like a caulk gun and stuff. And I was like, okay, like less scary now that just ran a person here. He's like, yeah, like no one's supposed to be in this room. Like nothing in the bathroom's working. We're like working on everything. So then I'm like, well, I need to be at like a black tie thing in like 30 minutes. So I definitely need a shower. (laughs) And so I go downstairs. They give me a new room, nine floors above that one. I take the key back up to my room to get my stuff. The key doesn't work. Go back down, get that, get my stuff. Go up to the other room, open up the door, and there's three guys in there that are staying there. So they've now given me a key to somebody else's room. And I'm like, all right. (laughs) So I go back down. They do eventually get me another room, but... They were like, oh, but somebody else has to check in later. So I showered in a room and apparently they were supposed to clean it. And I left my stuff in the other room and I end up like 30 minutes late to everything. But look, the history of the world, it's like not that big of a deal. I was surprisingly like not frustrated through this whole time. Like, I don't know why. I was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, but I never got mad at anybody. I just was like, eh. What are you going to do? Well, some point, it's just comical. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. As that. So, I mean, imagine if you were showering and someone just came in. Yeah. I would just be like, yeah. That's the oh, point where I would get cool. mad. I'd be like, enough is enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, on that one. We're all trying to say funny, but we can't share a room. Yeah. Right. Oh, my gosh. Well, <laughs> this was fantastic. Thank you for sharing your story with us. And, and hopefully, you know, a bunch of people will listen to this and bring more awareness um, to spinal cord injuries, too. And thank you for everything you're doing out there to bring, uh, you know, another investment class to, to the more more people and uh, get more wine to people, too. That's a good that's a good cause. So we always a good cause. Your <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. I will. <laughs> And thank you, everyone. Yeah. And thanks, everyone else, for listening and watch or watching this episode of the Framework Podcast.